in 2009, Ann Wolfe and I were um, talking about who the artists were we might engage that would lift the Center for Art and Environment and the archives and the programming here at the museum around art and environment. Who could help us lift that up to the next level? And how was, how was there a way for us to connect back to some of the people who started eco-art and environmental art and the people who were working in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and really beginning to shape the conversation that we're having today? And she said to me, she looked at me and she said, she said a handful of words. She said, Helena Newton Harrison. And I was very quiet. And she looked at me, she said, what, I've worked with them before, you know, it's fine. And I said, yeah, but it's the Harrisons. You know, it's like, I mean, these are gods in the field, so to speak. And um, she said, look, just call them up. And I, so I did. And they had done a work, uh, actually, for a show that we had done about the Sierra Nevada about a dozen years before, 10 years before. And, um, and I, I posed a question to, to Newton and Helen, and I said, would you be interested in sort of continuing that work. I mean, you, you sort of outlined the watersheds of the 400 mile long mountain range and did this beautiful map for us and a text that went with it. And, and he said, oh boy, would we like to, we'd like to really do something, yeah. Uh, how about a 50 year project to uh, redesign the, basically the, the biome of a mountain range? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Helena Newton started coming to Reno and having these regular meetings with us and with the Desert Research Institute and with other partners. And um, basically, Newton and Helen will describe this project to you. It's a very ambitious project. What's interesting about it, for me, comes at two levels. One of which is, of course, we're not dealing with just a site. You don't call a mountain range a site. You don't even call it a region. It's an entire system. And that's something that the Harrisons have been engaged with since, I think, the mid-1970s, is dealing with systems. So they're not site-specific artists in the sense that we tend to think of that. They're not artists working, you know, all art is local, all environmental matters, you know, act locally, think globally, all that. They're dealing with systems that, the systems that function locally and function globally. So in a way, when that question was asked this morning about how do we, how do we propose art that addresses an answer to certain kinds of situations, the Harrisons have been doing this for 45 years. Um, I guess the other thing that, that really interests me is the fact that they are proposing a project that's going to outlast them. And they're doing it gleefully. You know, they've taken this 50-year project. You know, will you go, will, come on, we'll commit to it. Will you, will you, the museum, commit to it? OK. So anyway, with no further ado, Helena Newton Harrison, please. This mic on? We do. Okay, I got, I got this little thing. Hey, you got the gizmo. <laughs> well, that 45 years is showing. Uh, in 1978, we, uh, we did a prophetic work. Generally, what we do is generate a guiding metaphor and then become obedient. Um, so, we're going to read you the last text of a work we did entitled The Lagoon Cycle. It's actually a 360 foot long mural in 60 parts, 8 feet tall, presently in the basement of the um, Centre Pompidou. The director who bought it liked it. The director who took over hated it. So, <laughs> there we go. Now, whoops, got to push a button. Mm -hmm. Here. So, so we, did a, we, we drew a world map. We had become uh, uh, quite sophisticated about carbon sequestration and carbon production at that time. And uh, we knew we were beyond being in an interglacial. And so, so we drew a world map. And we drew the map at the 100 meter line. And uh, what you can do is you can see what happens uh, when you do such a thing. Is, is this a button over here? Oh, hmm. well, maybe. Anyway. If you look at Australia, you see great inland lakes. If you look at the Amazon over there, it's filled up. We didn't do so well on Florida and so on. <laughs> so, uh, so, we, so, we, so we wrote this text. And this text has been the guide for a number of works that we'll show you. Go right there. OK. And the waters will rise slowly at the boundary, at the edge, redrawing that boundary continually, moment by moment, all over, all together, all at once. 
It is a graceful drawing and redrawing, this response to the millennia of the making of fire. And as the waters rise slowly in the Red Sea and the Dead Sea, the Caspian, the North, the Baltic, and the Black, the ocean gyres will redraw themselves, as will the currents and the tides. And over time, gracefully, this rising tide will flow up every river that once flowed down to the sea. And each fresh water tongue will withdraw before the advance of the salt up the St. Lawrence, the Columbia, the Amazon, the White Nile and the Blue, the Volga, the Don, the Danube and the Thames, the Seine and the Loire, the Rhone and the Rhine and the Garonne, the Ganges, the Congo, the Tigris and Euphrates, the Yellow, the Amur, the Irrawaddy, the Leda, the Potomac and the Snake, and all rivers named and unnamed. And the floodplains that are farmed upon and lived upon will become marshes, or swamps, or bogs, or beds for swollen rivers, or shallow inland seas. And the tropics will become uninhabitable, and the far north will become temperate. And corn, and rice, and wheat, and beans, and plantain, manioc, and yams, and all the grains, and starchy roots, known and unknown, named and unnamed, will have to grow elsewhere than now. And most life, known and unknown, will have to go elsewhere than now, as vast parts of the eastern seaboard of the United States, <clears throat> parts of Europe near the North Sea, and much of South America near the Amazon, and China in some world, and many parts, and Russia in some parts. And in this new beginning, this continuously re-beginning, will you feed me when my lands can no longer produce? And will I f uh, uh, keep you when your lands are covered with water so that together we can withdraw as the waters rise? The issue here. <laughs> the guiding metaphor. The metaphor you see missing in most of the photographs you saw this morning is, will I help you and will you help me? That is to say, we are in a sharing relationship with the planet. You're the person who stated this clearly, most lucidly, most feelingfully, is Aldo Leopold back in the mid 40s? Yeah. Um, so uh, how seriously we take this. Um, we were commissioned by, uh, and actually won a prize there for it, we were commissioned by DEFRA, I forget how, Department of Various Things, and given about, <laughs> given about what amounts to be $450,000 to kindly do something for Britain where they would get to understand what was happening with global warming. Could art reach out? And so we said, sure. We didn't know we could. But um, that's the neat thing about being an artist. You know, you don't have to know the end to begin. <laughs> okay, so we first had our map makers. We've got map makers in Toulouse who, who work on this stuff. So we first had our map makers map, map uh, Britain, uh, uh, first with a five meter rise. Didn't do so well. A uh, quarter of a million people have to move. Then a 10 meter ocean rise, unlikely, but we took a look. Then a 15 meter ocean rise, very unlikely, but we still took a look. And so we made a triptych that uh, took a look at that. Then we did an exhibition, and what you see on the floor is a, uh, probably a 15 by eight foot model of the island of Britain with six projectors above it, projecting the waters rising and floodplains every two meters. The idea here was to democratize global warming information. Everybody who saw this could see where his house was or her house was. And everybody then could become a planner and a thinker. And so we wanted to take the information out of the hands of the specialists. In fact, um, we would argue that it's time, the people who must take over this world have to become generalists, um, uh, period. And that's not negotiable. So, if you don't mind. Uh, Helen and I have trouble negotiating. Uh, we're, we're a little rigid. But um, so uh, we decided to say, what, 
all over Britain was this conversation about moving upward with development. And they were going to make greener houses and smaller developments and do efficient type things in the way they always did and the way they knew how to do. So instead, we decided to go up to the top of the Pennines and take a real look. And so, and could we find a place to invent a village that sequestered more carbon than it used? So. Read it. We were standing at a Liverpool dock, not far from the Tate Gallery, imagining the waters rising, first five, then 10, then 15 meters, thinking about the upward movement of people that responded to that and talking about how that might happen gracefully, deciding to replace the term development with the term settlement. For us, it is a metaphorical flip, an aid to thinking, and thereafter to designing and settlement, not just for ourselves, but for all living things that we need to survive and are dependent upon and dependent upon us. The difference between, differences between settlement and development are profound. The term settlement has embedded in it the idea of habitat for ourselves and of riches for other, and of niches for other living creatures. Then you said or I said, the metaphorical shift between development design and settlement design becomes visible at its simplest level in selecting an appropriate site and then turning settlement and tuning it to the carrying capacity of the terrain. That's enough. So we went up there and with a team from, she from Sheffield University and their landscape group, we selected a place in the Pennines. Um, so we took a look at it. We wanted it to be 40 square miles or a little more. Why? Because 40 square miles, if it was um, one third forest and two thirds well-managed grassland, would sequester about two tons of carbon per year per forest and one ton of carbon per year per well-managed uh, um, grasslands. At which point then we're looking at what amounts to be, oh, 36,000 tons of carbon a year over if you had a 40 square mile site. So we decided to locate one, but first look at the mapping of it. Uh, this place had about 4,000 people in Hayward and beyond. Well, in Hayfield, I mean. Well, that meant we could make a 4,000 person village there and blend it and see if we could produce this thing. So, um, we began to ana analyze it from the perspective of watersheds. And we found out that there were 18 little watersheds there. And that if you analyzed it that way, the watersheds told you where to put the forest. And the forest told you where to put the, uh, where the rivers were and enhance them and purify them. And, and then uh, uh, the forest and the rivers together told you where the grasslands could be. So, uh, figuring it that way, oh, I've got to find a button. Ah. So we came up with this drawing, and uh, what it does, if I can ever find a little button here, well, maybe I can't. Well, what it does is shows this, and so we designed it in such a way that it would be repeatable, and so we found out that in that terrain. You needed to be, you needed to find 40 square miles to make a carbon sequestering sustainable field to grow a village in. Now, some other things turned up. The, the way you harvested this was in bits and pieces. So normal monocultural thinking couldn't happen there. And as you did that, then that suggested you had to invent a different kind of, of economic system. And so on and so forth. So the concept that we had was begin with the ground and work up. And that's what we do in all of our work. And begin with the planet as a system. And we're all parts of that system, as is every living thing. And we have to realize that anything we do affects the system in one way or another. And anything that happens in the system affects us. Whoops. So then um, getting ambitious. We proposed to make, I guess, uh, 70 little villages around the Pennines. You can see where they become more intense in the middle of England. And um, 
Guess what's happened? I guess five years after the work, there are teams now in place, and we're starting to propose a Pennine ring for Britain. Uh, this is not impossible, it's only improbable. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it doesn't want to have too many illusions about this because we're running exactly counter to the way mind works in the world, the way mind has been trained to work. Your photographer here who was saying, you know, there's something the matter with the head and we've got to worry about the heart, um, he's uh, quite, quite right. Sorry to paraphrase you so brutally. Um, but the thing is that empathy is required here. Empathy with the terrain, and, but it has to be an informed empathy, not a mushy one. And it has to be tough-minded. <laughs> so, uh, so that would be the Britain piece. So, that was, so we did a number of works on the upward movement of people based upon the original prediction. However, um, we got commissioned by the European Union and the German government and four or five museums and asked what we would do and we said we do a work called Peninsula Europe. Um, and uh, we, then we did many children of Peninsula Europe. Uh, so we won't show you the exhibition, but we'll show you the work, uh, two of the pieces from it. What you're looking at here is, the, is a peninsula. We define it as a field of play. What do we mean by a field of play? If you look at this, you would see the Dnesta River and the Vistula Rivers heading up to the uh, uh, Baltic and the Black Sea, respectively. They almost join. They're only 30 kilometers apart in the Carpathians, which are right below them. My pointer worked, I would show you. Then, uh, then this whole peninsula has a water surround. Well. Uh, the, the, the salient feature in this peninsula is the way the mountains work against the lands. And so that, we decided, was a field of play. And, th and then we thought, well, you know what? There's an insight to be had here. It has the look that geophysical systems, geophysical systems set the conditions for ecosystems, and the complexity of ecosystems generate and help generate cultural systems. And, and this place is so complex that way that uh, you have more languages and sub-languages in this region than any other place in the world. So, we began to say, well, what's true about this place? Turns out the yellows are about half a million square, no, 320,000 square kilometers of pasture land. The browns are about pretty close to 2 million, 2.4 million square kilometers of mostly factory farm, not good for the topsoil, and then the greens are mostly forest, but mostly plantation. Um, that's about half a million square kilometers, just to get you to feel how much space we're talking about. There are 3.3 million square kilometers there, and there are about 450 million people there of all kinds. Uh, Asia has similar complexities yeah. to it. Uh, oh, that one worked. That's what you do. OK. Um, so. We did the following work. The proposal for type to OK. The goal of the work was to invent a new trans-European open canopy forest. Grassland from Portugal and Spain over the Pyrenees across the central massif to the Carpathians and somewhat beyond, the concept suggests that complex mixed uh, complex mixed forests can create a strong enough sponge phenomenon in the available earths to replace in good measure the waters once supplied to the rivers and the lands by slow summer snow and glacial melt. The core research to locate appropriate forest types will be translatitudinal and paleobotanical. Well, why would we do such a thing? Well, it turns out that from crunching the numbers, it looks like drought is going to move up and cover half of the half of Europe. It's already happening in Spain and Portugal. And uh, um, at the same time, the temperature rise will be about 10 degrees up there Fahrenheit in the mountains. And lots of, those for lots of the foresting up there won't stand up to uh, disease and they won't stand up to fires. So the question Helen and I took up was, 
You know, if that happens, 440 million people are going to experience starvation. Civil, civil society will be um, disrupted. Ecosystems will be in terrible shape. It will be quite difficult for species to move upward because so, much of them, so many of them have been done in by farming on the one hand and infrastructure on the other. So what would happen if we helped species move up and the species moved up in such a way that when, they, uh, bit, when, the, when the plantings bit into the ground and the rains came heavy, the waters, the, the earths would hold the water in some measure equivalent to or partially equivalent to the loss of glacial melt that was the cause of the problems at all. And s uh, snow uh, melt. <laughs> so, th so that's the kind of stuff we started to think about um, and uh, propose and argue for. Um, we have um, some principal ecologists there who love the idea, but nobody else does. Why? Because the discourse in Europe is about, as somebody said, jobs and money. Not about, like, starvation, pain, the death of ecosystems, the death of forests, what's coming down the line. So we're arguing that we're looking at a short 50 to 75 year now. And you're seeing it in Europe one way. You see it in Tibet another way. I won't read the Tibet thing. You want, you want to read it? Yeah. Just this much. Um, the research, uh, the story of Tibet. I don't think we're going to have time. Okay. How much time do we have? We have another, what, 50? 10 minutes. Oh, OK. Then we'll move along. Everybody else went over a little bit. <laughs> when we go over, we feel guilty because we feel, we feel like we're stealing time from somebody else. <laughs> How about a little bit later dinner? We won't go over more than two or three minutes. Come, <laughs> read it from there to there. No, I have to more. The research of Chinese glaciologists and glaciologists from India appears to be right. 80% of the glaciers in Tibet and surrounding areas can disappear in the next 35 years. Research further indicates these glaciers will shrink so much that their melting borders will dry up, profoundly affecting the Salween, Mekong, Huangho, Brahmaputra, Yangtze, Ganges, and Indus River systems that traverse Inner Mongolia, China, Tibet, the Autonomous Zone, India, Burma, Lama, Laos, Cambodia, South Vietnam, Bangladesh, Kashmir, and Pakistan. A force majeure has come into being in the form of global warming that will work to the disadvantage of one-sixth of the Earth's population, or about 1.2 billion people who live in the seven drain basins that comprise 2,404,820 2, square miles. So what we proposed was, uh, what, you see, the key issue here is the Chinese will, uh, to get water for the Yangtze and the Huangho, will um, channel waters away from the waters that would normally go since seven great rivers that start, in the, 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 that start in the plateau nourish the whole of India. So China's gonna pull that water to themselves as much as they can for their own survival. It's their land. Well, unless you rehab that land to such, like a two million, acre uh, square kilometer rehab, unless you do something like that, you're going to have wars between China and India. You're going to have, again, starvation. You're going to have endless problems. Um, and at the same time, if you do that, you will have recreated an ecosystem of great merit. Uh, so, the act of, instead of, so that the act of creation becomes multiplied. I, I would like to add here, I'm, I'm not read the thing again. Uh, I won't read it, but the number of countries affected by this is not just India and China. It's every country in the uh, whole continent that uh, we affected by it in one way or another. Okay. Well, so um, right now we have friends in China who, who are working in the upper parts of the Yangtze and the Huangho, the Yalu rather, and uh, um, uh, 
we've just sent this to them and they'll, they'll start the rehab up there if they can. And we'll work with them too. So, uh, this began in an interesting way. We had gotten a request uh, from the Dalai Lama through a friend of, of, of ours at the university who was, happened to be his science advisor. He wanted to make a, a this was 10, 15 years ago, a peace park out of the Tibetan plateau. And uh, he wondered if we could help him make that park. And that's how this work started in 1993, and it kept morphing. The Dalai Lama got a little annoyed at us because we said, look, you're, you're at the top of the bed, the, you've chopped all the trees down on, on the mountainsides. Um, maybe you need to rehab the mountainsides. Maybe we shouldn't be worrying so much about the bed. But now we are. But to shift now so you could see how we uh, um, uh, shift from scale, from small to large to an intermediate. Sierra We're, Nevada, an adaptation. OK. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, because uh, I have to lay the, con the context. So you yeah. read that OK? We negotiate a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you, should ha you should see what happens if we don't. Um, <laughs> You don't want to see what happens if we don't. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, this what, is the story a tree stump can tell us. Helen, would you let me finish this before you read that? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> pace, pace. <laughs> OK. Um, so the, the thing was, we went up to the, uh, oops. Oh, yeah, you'll see this upstairs. Uh, so we went up to the nature reserve to take a look at what's happening up there because we really wanted to prove on the ground what we were talking about. We wanted to make stations on the ground where in some places you did nothing and in some places you enhanced the species there to hold water in the ground. And so at first we were going to do it at, uh, at, uh, that, uh, in that area there. And then we, went, we moved to um, uh, Sage Hen which is the next watershed over. If you look at the one on the left, that's the, the Independence Lake watershed. If you look on the right, that's the Prosser Creek watershed. And if you look in the middle, it's the Sage Hen Creek watershed, and that's where we worked. What Helen's gonna do is read the founding insight, the, 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 the guiding metaphor that let us see this. Uh, this is the story of what a tree stump can tell us. In the Independence Lake Drain Basin, the cut stump of a forest giant uh, sh showed a topsoil level marked at a certain degree over, over 100 years ago. Looking at the topsoil level on that same stump now, seeing the loss of over a six-inch six level the outcome from erosion, overgrazing, cutting trees again and again, leaving a topsoil debt of up to six inches, reducing the storage of water, reducing the storage of carbon, leaving a half life web in the earth. Some 12,000 years ago, when the glaciers withdrew, leaving only subsoil and gravel behind, it took about one inch uh, uh, topsoil grew about one inch every millennia, and it took us a long time, thus a 6,000 year topsoil debt now exists, both in the reserve and over much of the Sierra Nevada, amounting to many billion cubic feet, foot loss. Thus, an act of creation, a topsoil generating system is needed, an adaptation at modest scale. So. Um, working with sage, sage hen folk, we found a transect, a six mile transect, uh, that has a drop of about 2,700 feet that starts at the high grounds of sage hen uh, watershed and ends up in the uh, uh, stampede reservoir. And we proposed putting 50, oh, 20 to 30 double frames, not in the ground, but maybe framed with rope. Uh, maybe each one the size of a tennis court, or half a tennis court. And each one of those 
wooden frames put into the earth. Well, Helen likes wooden frames, but I'm telling you, maybe wooden frames would rot, rot but if you put a, a, um, a good a hemp up, they wouldn't rot. They've got to last 50 years. <laughs> anyway, that's all about the art of it. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and that in one, of the, in one of the framed areas would be left alone. The other framed area, a careful study of species lower in the watershed that would, pro that would probably move up if they could, biased toward the species grouping would not be exotic so much, but they would be definitely biased toward biodiversity and holding the land and then holding erosion and then holding water in the topsoil for slow release. If this worked, then we're talking about a model for the Sierra Nevada as a whole. It, uh, there's also the fact that you go back uh, to uh, paleoecology and you say what survived there in the time when the temperatures were reaching a similar thing to the temperatures now. And the paleobotanical research we have, which we, we will already have uh, uh, folks working with us on, uh, would then be a lens with which to look at our now. Yeah. And so we really got to do stuff like this. And we've got to really go back into sharing and working with the whole environment and seeing ourselves as part of, not as the top predator. Um, there are two things that I want to talk about to end with. One is that we formed a center at the University of California at uh, um, uh, Santa Cruz, where, we're, where we teach. Uh, we're, we're emeritus professors from, from San Diego, UC San Diego. And that center is And called research professors at the moment <laughs> from UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> What's in a title? Um, the, the only reason for worrying about the title was we had to become principal investigators. And so as long as we were entitled enough to become principal investigators, uh, we were okay, which we are. Um, so that the, the uh, Center for the Study of the Force Majeure, Force Majeure Studies, will pull together and begin working on these things. We predict two things. One thing most important, art won't hold it. Science won't hold it. Regional planning won't hold it. The silos we have invented in the now are backward thinking and backward thinking. We have to invent, we have to invent what we would call hybrids, new forms, wherein, for instance, if you're looking, we will propose that what we do here is a work of art, okay? And if you have a path between them and the right narration, that, that, that it will be. And at the same time, though, if, if classes come up, it's a work of education, and the art drops back. When the scientists are really working on the parts, the art work falls back, and the science takes the foreground. And so you need, we need those kind of works to come to pass. And the Center for the Force, a Study of the Force Majeure will do that. One last thing. We're starting a Force Majeure game. Yes. Should I give it away? Uh, well, well, you should say what the Force Majeure is. Oh, <laughs> hey, uh, did, did we not say what that, you sure you did. It said the global warming and transaction with all the shit we're doing in the world is a Force Majeure. <laughs> no? Okay. That's, that's, that, that, that gets right to the nub of it. <laughs> Helen, uh, I, would, I would say in our work, one of the things that Helen always does is corrects me. And the reason I don't, the reason I don't bitch about it is that she's right most of the time. <laughs> and I can't tell when she's wrong. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the force majeure game that we, that we work with game masters on will take the following form. It will propose that we have a, that um, we have a world gross national product. And what we, what we need is a gross transnational, um, I guess, eco-security system, not unlike the social security system. And that we need a feedback mechanism into it as a, like 1% of the gross national product. After all, we make everything out of the, on the back of the, of the ecosystem. And that would give a little under a trillion dollars a year to muck around with. Uh, the game will deal with that. Thank you.